So before we get started, I thought I would just ask everybody in the room, I mean, um, this is a neuroscience group, right? Like everybody is in neurosciences. Is it all neurology? Okay. Psychiatry? Anybody that does stuff in psychiatry here? Neurosurgery? It's all neurologists. Okay, we have a neuro, two neurosurgeons. Okay, right on. So I like to know who I'm speaking to, so thank you. I might wander around the room a little bit, um, and I, I like the kind of interactive talks, so if anybody has questions or just wants to speak up, feel free. Okay. All right, uh, so um, as Mike had mentioned, and thank you again for the introduction, um, I, I'm not um, on your faculty. I'm, I'm not in the Department of Neurology, but I am one of you. I, I'm a neurologist. Uh, I'm board certified in neurology and in sleep medicine. Um, so just a little bit about kind of how I got to where I am. Um, I, I, uh, during my neurology residency, one of my um, favorite mentors was Peter Williamson, who was uh, an epileptologist when he wasn't flying around and when he wasn't driving his cars. Um, and he was a really great uh, neurologist and epileptologist. And he was seminal in the development of uh, video EEG monitoring and um, developing the right steps to make that work to properly diagnose patients with uh, unusual spells, including epileptic ta attacks and other things. Um, so um, I really uh, enjoyed working with him and enjoyed the subject matter. So I was going to be an epileptologist, actually. So, uh, so I moved from New Hampshire to, uh, to Seattle and um, uh, did an epilepsy fellowship at uh, the University of Washington. And uh, during that time, I was invited to spend some time in the new sleep lab that was developing at Harborview and did several months of rotations there and just kind of fell in love. So um, I kind of switched over to sleep medicine and completed a sleep medicine fellowship. All right, so part of my fellowship uh, included three months at Hennepin uh, Medical Center um, in uh, Minneapolis, which was headed by uh, Mark Mahold and Carlos Schenk. So Mark Mahold is a neurologist, and um, he uh, has no problem speaking his mind about things. So a number of years ago at the national sleep meetings, uh, when he was accepting an achievement award, uh, an academic achievement award, uh, he uttered this phrase or something of this sort. Um, and it was kind of like a, a president uh, at the State of the Union address saying something partisan. Um, about half the room fell silent, and the other uh, half of the room clapped wildly. So, um, so uh, sleep is very much a neurologic function. It's generated by the brain. So it's very pertinent uh, to, um, to me as a neurologist and hopefully to everybody in this room. All right, so uh, in the late 70s, uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which at the time was called the American Sleep Disorders Association, um, decided to start a nosology classification system for the various sleep disorders. And that has gone through a number of iterations over the years. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yes. Is it cutting out or something? Okay. Can you, uh, can you hear me if I'm not? Should I continue to be? I, I think you're okay either way. Okay. All right. Um, so in 2014, the third edition of the International Classification of Sleep Disorders was published, and that is generally utilized as kind of the gold standard for nosology for the uh, sleep disorders that uh, we recognize today in sleep medicine. So uh, there are seven general forms of sleep disorders. Uh, there are a number of different types of insomnia. Uh, there are the sleep-related breathing disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. There are numerous central disorders of hypersomnolence, uh, primarily narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. There are circadian rhythm abnormalities, uh, such as delayed sleep phase syndrome and non-24-hour sleep-wake syndrome, things that you may have heard about. Uh, parasomnias, which we will be spending most of our time talking about, that has to do with complex, uh, abnormal, or disruptive behaviors during your sleep or out of sleep. There are sleep-related movement disorders which differ from parasomnias in that they're very simple stereotype uh, movements, such as dreadic limb movement disorder, uh, restless legs, rhythmic movement, rhythmic movement disorder, and then just kind of a catch-all um, section called uh, other sleep disorders, which includes sleep-related epilepsy, which is part of the differential for, um, for abnormal movements during sleep. Okay. So uh, before we start talking about um, the different forms of parasomnias, I just wanted to just give you a little bit of a background on uh, our states of consciousness. It's generally accepted 
that uh, we um, humans uh, always live in one of uh, three states of consciousness. There's wakefulness, there's non-REM sleep, and there's REM sleep. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of research done on REM sleep and non-REM sleep, uh, and we understand a lot quantitatively about both of those entities, but uh, somewhat embarrassingly, we still really don't know exactly what the functions are for non-REM sleep and REM sleep. For non-REM sleep, we understand that there is probably some kind of restorative function. There are active metabolic processes. Uh, there is a reduction in certain metabolic processes. There appears to be a restorative function metabolically and endocrinologically uh, during non-REM sleep. During REM sleep, there appears to be more than that. There's a lot of areas of the brain that are very active um, and uh, REM sleep appears to be associated with uh, a number of other functions, such as memory consolidation. But um, under normal circumstances, during a regular 24-hour wake uh, sleep cycle, uh, these uh, three states of being typically are pretty distinct, and uh, they kind of declare themselves kind of fully, right? Like all of us in this room hopefully are fully awake right now, right? We have declared ourselves morphologically as being awake. Um, and under normal circumstances, once we transition off into non-REM sleep at the beginning of the night, we declare ourselves physiologically as being in non-REM sleep. And uh, we've uh, created uh, ways of defining uh, different stages of sleep. And we define these stages of sleep based primarily on EEG findings. So, uh, so we have, uh, I'm going to try this uh, virtual thing here. Um, so uh, so uh, by EEG, we can determine roughly when a person is awake, uh, if they're neurologically intact. Um, and uh, we can determine different stages of sleep, which again are based primarily on EEG findings. Uh, there's stage, uh, stage one, which is now called N1 sleep. There's stage two or N2 sleep. And there used to be stage three and stage four non-REM sleep, but now it's called N3, which is the deepest form of sleep we have. So you know how children, for example, can be very difficult to awaken, right? Like you shake them and it's really, really hard to awaken them. They have lots and lots of N3, uh, or what used to be called slow wave sleep. It's very, very difficult to arouse. It's the deepest form of sleep we have, right? And then we have dream sleep called rapid eye movement sleep, which we'll talk about um, in some detail in a little bit. But the point is that we in science have kind of uh, defined uh, these stages of sleep and that allows us to make these nice little graphs about how we sleep at night. So this is uh, kind of a hypnogram uh, describing kind of a typical night's sleep. And this is an important diagram to remember some basic points about because I'll be referring to this a little bit later in my talk. But as you can see in the typical neurologically intact human adults, um, we tend to have lots and lots of deep non-REM sleep during the first half or during the first third of the night. Okay. By the way, these cycles here that you see, these are called ultradian cycles. And in a typical human, uh, these cycles last for about 90 to 100 minutes. We typically have somewhere between four and six ultradian cycles in the course of a typical night, okay? Uh, and as the night goes on, we typically tend to have more and more REM sleep, which is the reason why we typically remember dreaming around four, five, six o'clock in the morning, right? Nobody knows why we're designed this way as humans, but we are. Um, and so, um, so we sleep through these cycles. But the point is, is that this is actually kind of fluid. It's not like your brain switches off N2 and switches on N3. Um, this is a very fluid process. So there are times, especially if there's a perturbation in your system, whether it's an external stimulus or an internal stimulus, that can actually uh, cause a blurring or a dissociation between uh, two states. Okay, so sometimes there can be just kind of this little uh, gray zone for a while um, in which you're kind of both, for example, both awake and both asleep. And uh, that is where parasomnias lie. That uh, parasomnias are an abnormal manifestation of those dissociative processes in which you don't fully declare what stage of sleep you're in. Okay. So let's talk now about uh, parasomnias in a little bit more detail. So um, as you probably know, people can make all different kind of unusual movements during sleep, right? You may have heard of that from your patients or 
from a family member or a friend, or maybe you may have heard about you yourself doing this. Um, so the International Classification of Sleep Disorders defines uh, parasomnias as undesirable physical events or experiences that occur during entry into sleep, within sleep, or during arousal from sleep. So a key word in this uh, definition is experience. Sorry. Um, so this word experience is, is very important here, OK? This makes parasomnias different from uh, bread and butter, sleep-related movement disorders, and that something is experienced oftentimes, either by the patient internally or the patient externally, or somebody that's around the patient, right? Uh, so the movements are not simple and repetitive usually. They are complex. They are non-stereotyped. They're, they appear goal-directed, um, so they're very complicated movements. And there's a wide spectrum of those movements as well. Um, they can involve behaviors uh, that look like you're awake. Um, they can uh, involve what appear to be emotions, um, perceptions, and dreams uh, and with various degrees of autonomic nervous system activity. Um, and again, this has everything to do with that uh, brief kind of dissociation uh, that people have if they're not able to completely declare which state of being they're in. Okay? All right, so in my clinic, um, there are times in which uh, I have a patient referred to me specifically and only because of an abnormal movement during sleep. But more often than not, I see them as kind of an incidental finding. I happen to see them because of something else, uh, snoring or something. And oh, by the way, you know, my, I'm, I've been told by my spouse that I'm making these movements during my sleep. Or it comes out in the clinic questionnaire that we give to them. And it's oftentimes an incidental finding, which I always just found, I found kind of interesting. Um, and when I dig deeper with patients, oftentimes I get almost some resistance to talk about it. Like, they don't think it's that big of a deal. And I've heard all these different um, types of uh, uh, phrases uh, over the years in my practice, uh, folks that just kind of want to blow off the movements. Like, it's really kind of nothing, even though the bed partner is um, kind of freaking out over the movements, right? Uh, so I, I've always found that interesting that people oftentimes tend to downplay these um, uh, these movements, and I think probably the reason why is because many times they may not necessarily experience the problem themselves uh, internally. Uh, they may be making movements that somebody else is aware of, but they're not necessarily aware of it. So uh, so they may not think it's a problem, or they may even sometimes deny that that uh, the movements are actually happening. The problem with that is that there are potential consequences to those movements, right? Some of parasomnias uh, make you fall out of bed, can make you leap out of bed. Um, I've had patients that, uh, that have come to me uh, for the first time specifically because they were injured, they were hospitalized, or they would broken a bone or something because of a movement. Um, and then there are a host of secondary problems that are associated with these parasomnias too. Um, if you're making a lot of movements, that can cause sleep disruption, for example, which can cause you to feel sleepy during the day. Um, it's uh, clear that a number of these parasomnias can be associated with mood problems, such as depression and anxiety. They can cause obvious problems for the bed partner, uh, and uh, some of these parasomnias can actually injure bed partners. And importantly, these, uh, these movements can actually be preventable depending on, um, depending on what uh, kind of parasomnia we're talking about. So it's actually something that deserves clinical attention, especially if there's potential for injury. Okay, so um, the, uh, the International Classification of Sleep Disorders um, kind of divides parasomnias into four basic groups. And uh, we'll talk primarily about the first two here, the non-REM uh, parasomnias and the REM-related parasomnias. But there's this kind of uh, wastebasket uh, term, parasomnia, uh, other parasomnias, as well as some isolated symptoms and normal variants. And we won't really be talking about much of these today. But sleep talking, just a word about that. A lot of people sleep talk, right? Does anybody sleep talk in this room? Or does anybody sleep talk in this room? OK. That's not really abnormal in and of itself, right? It used to be considered maybe an abnormality, but um, we now consider it kind of a normal variant. But it does depend on the clinical circumstance. So we'll be spending most of our time on the top two. Um, and uh, the primary differential um, would include uh, movements that follow cortical arousal. In other words, if something's causing an awakening, or if you're awakening spontaneously, what do you do? You know, you move, you stir, 
And so sometimes that could be misinterpreted as an abnormal movement during sleep. There's sleep-related movement disorders, as I mentioned before, that include restless leg syndrome, periodic movement disorder, rhythmic movement disorder. These are very simple kind of stereotype movements, maybe with the exception of RLS. <laughs> but uh, these are not um, generally considered parasomnias because of the stereotype nature of the movements. Okay? And then there's uh, sleep-related epilepsies. Um, and that is actually a primary uh, item on the differential for some of the more complex cases of parasomnia. Any questions so far? Uh, everybody good so far? Okay. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about non-REM parasomnias. And uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, uh, the different parasomnias. Uh, there's three primary types. Uh, and then um, I'm hoping to show some video with the time we have, and I'll just show video and talk until we don't have time anymore, okay? Um, so what's important to know about non-REM parasomnias is, is that these are generally considered disorders of arousal. And what I mean by that is that people with these forms of parasomnias typically have these events occurring in the setting of an abrupt arousal from deep non-REM sleep, okay? So remember the hypnogram that I showed you before with lots of non deep non-REM sleep during the first third or first half of the night. That's the time in which these parasomnias typically occur. So the more deep sleep you have and the more likely that you are to have in a cortical arousal, regardless of the reason, the more likely for these non-REM parasomnias to show. Okay? So um, even though there are several different types of non-REM parasomnias, uh, they tend to follow fairly similar patterns. Uh, it typically occurs in people of younger age, oftentimes children. Um, there can be things that can uh, make uh, these types of parasomnias more likely, such as stress, anxiety, illnesses of various sorts, sleep deprivation. Because sleep deprivation, remember, if you're getting not as much quantity of sleep as your body needs, your brain essentially tries to make up for that by increasing the quality, in other words, making it deeper. So the more deep non-REM sleep you have because of the sleep deprivation, the more likely that a parasomnia may occur. Does that make sense? Okay. And then there are triggers that can be both internal or external that can cause the parasomnia to occur. And that can be in internal, such as untreated sleep apnea or some other sleep disorder, or it could be external, such as, you know, living in a place, an apartment with the, you know, where you're where there's a lot of noise around, or if somebody touches you, these can trigger uh, non-REM parasomnia events. Okay. So there are three basic types with a couple of offshoots from a couple of them. Um, confusional arousals are the most basic type. It's a situation in which a patient kind of slowly or abruptly awakens from sleep. They kind of look around a little bit. They look kind of confused. They're mumbling. But there's no panic going on. They're just kind of going, you know, they're just kind of confused. If somebody witnesses what's happening and tries to speak with them, they may or may not be um, responsive to that. Uh, and, um, but, it's, uh, but they don't get out of bed. Um, you know, there's no panic or screaming or anything like that. Um, and uh, so it's a pretty basic, brief, non-REM parasomnia, and then they just kind of turn over and float back to sleep. Now, if they get out of bed, uh, then that transitions from a confusional arousal to sleepwalking or some amulism. Has anybody sleepwalked in the past? Anybody? One person? So that's obviously a more complex behavior, right? Um, so uh, so uh, the, a person may wander around in the bedroom, may actually open up doors and go down the hallway. Sometimes people can walk outside and across the street, so, right? So potentially some uh, dangerous situations there. Then there's something called sleep terrors. Does anybody know the difference between sleep terrors and nightmares? Anybody know the difference? Okay, because sometimes they can be confused, right? So a sleep terror is a situation in which there's a big blood-curdling scream, usually in a child, but sometimes adults. The parent rushes into the room because they're scared because they heard the screaming, and there's uh, the child is confused. Now, the difference between uh, sleep terrors and confusional arousals is that there's a lot of autonomic discharge. There's uh, tachycardia, there's sweating, uh, there's tachypnea. They're panicking, right? They appear to be panicking, um, and uh, they are inconsolable oftentimes. 
And this can last for a couple minutes or up to 10 to 20 minutes. So it can be terrifying to the parent, right? So in all of these uh, non-REM parasomnias, uh, a key point is that after the event is over and the patient awakens from sleep, they're usually completely amnestic of the event, okay? Sometimes there might be a little hint of some kind of recall of what happened, but by and large, they don't remember what happened. And that's the difference between a sleep terror and a nightmare. A nightmare is just simply remembering a bad dream and you wake up and you're tachycardic a little bit because it was a terrible dream, but you remember the dream, remember everything about it, and you're terrified afterwards because you woke up from the dream. Okay, so that's the difference. That's a REM phenomenon, okay? Um, now, one offshoot of confusional arousals is so-called sexomnia, which is uh, confusional arousals with uh, some additional sexual behaviors um, added in. Um, and then uh, an offshoot of sleepwalking is the sleep-related eating disorder, or SRED, S-R-E-D, in which um, uh, people may get out of bed and actually go somewhere to eat. It's not a, uh, a hunger-driven phenomenon. It's just an automatic behavior, which is an important thing to know about non-REM parasomnias. You're taking out the higher cortical function right, from the behavior. Right? So basically, the most primitive diencephalic part of your behavior, which includes sex, uh, eating, um, aggression, um, those are kind of left, and that's what ends up being seen in a parasomnia event, okay? So what I thought I would do is show a couple of examples of uh, these. Now, these examples that I have are from um, a DVD that um, Carlo Schenk uh, created. Um, who's one of the uh, people that, uh, that I trained with. So, let's see if I can. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show an example of some confusional arousals. Do we have audio? Okay. You can see she's just kind of looking around. There's some movement. It's non-specific, but you can see they can be kind of complex. They can be sudden in onset or um, slow in onset. They can be prolonged. They can last for 20, 30 minutes sometimes. I'll show another brief example here. I'm not hearing the video. I'm not hearing the audio. This one's a short one. Uh, she goes back off to sleep, right? Okay. Hmm. Okay. We'll do. Our, we'll do our best. <laughs> Thanks. All right. All right, uh, so this is not really a sleepwalking episode, but um, this, is, uh, this is a video that was captured uh, during a sleep study, and so the patient was all wired up, so, um, but you'll get the picture. By the way, these videos uh, were um, collected from Hennepin County Medical Center Sleep Disorder Center in the 80s and 90s, so they're old and grainy, but they still um, show what they need to show.
So you can imagine if the bed rail wasn't there, she probably would have right, gotten out of bed and started walking, um, especially if the tech did not intervene. Okay. I'm sorry we don't have the audio. Um, you will, you should hear a piercing scream here. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Carlos does give a little bit of commentary with some of these video uh, snippets, but uh, imagine that with an initial scream, and that's an example of um, of a night terror. Okay. Any questions so far? You good? Okay. All right. Yep. That's right. And that's where you and I are partners, Mike, right? Because um, there are times in which it's very difficult to characterize what's going on, right? Because some of them, because they can be sudden in, in, uh, uh, in onset. They can be brief sometimes. Um, and so there are times in which you need some EEG um, to determine what's going on. So typically what, go, uh, what you see if it's a non parasomnia is um, hypersynchronous delta kind of gen generalized during the event or just prior to the event. Uh, for nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, obviously you see sucking wake disturbance. So that's where that would be really important. There are a couple of things that you can use clinically that might help you dis uh, distinguish between the two. I mean, you know, frontal lobe seizures tend to be stereotyped. They tend to be brief. Um, they tend to occur abruptly. They can occur multiple times <coughs> a night sometimes, right? Um, uh, for uh, non rem parasomnias, um, they can be much more variable in presentation, right? And so that might help you. But ultimately, sometimes long term monitoring may be necessary. Okay. All right, uh, so let's move now to the REM-related parasomnias. And the primary one I want to talk about today is REM behavior disorder because it's pretty prevalent and um, you see this and it can cause injuries. There are some other things. We talked about nightmares, which usually is not uh, a severe clinical problem for most people, and uh, isolated sleep paralysis in which a patient awakens unable to move briefly, and that can be caused by lots of stuff. It's non nonspecific. And again, it's not usually something that comes uh, by itself to uh, the attention of a sleep physician. Okay. So let me talk a little bit more about dreaming. Um, a lot of people associate REM sleep with dreaming, and it's true, dreaming occurs during REM sleep, but you can have some dream imagery during non-REM sleep as well, okay? Non-REM sleep typically is associated with something amorphous, like a color, a cloud, a feeling, something like that, that people interpret as dream imagery. But a vast majority of what we recall as dreams uh, typically occurs during rapid eye movement sleep. So during REM sleep, that's when like the movie-like sequential dreams uh, happen. And by the way, you don't necessarily need to remember all your dreams to have REM sleep. Um, you can have plenty of REM sleep and just really not remember the dreaming. That's a normal um, variation of, uh, of human beings. Um, I typically have extremely rich dreams. Um, had one a couple hours ago, um, but my uh, but my my wife doesn't remember any dreaming, so um, it's, that's not necessarily abnormal. So at any rate, the, the sequential kind of movie-like dreams typically occur out of uh, rapid eye movement sleep. Okay. So the International Classification of Sleep Disorders uh, definition of REM behavior disorder are the following. There need to be repeated episodes of sleep-related vocalization and or complex motor behaviors. 
Okay, in other words, that part of it is not necessarily dream related, right? But the second part is behavior is documented by overnight sleep study testing or polysomnography, it's PSG, to occur during REM sleep or based on clinical history of dream enact enactment presumed to occur during REM sleep. In other words, uh, we need some piece of clinical history and if there is no clinical history, uh, for example, if there's no bed partner and you don't really know exactly what's going on, then a sleep study then uh, should show um, some dream, physical dream enacting behaviors. Thirdly, this is important, overnight sleep study testing demonstrates REM sleep without atonia. In other words, under normal circumstances, during rapid eye movement sleep, most of your skeletal muscles should be essentially paralyzed, with the exception of some little phasic twitches. There shouldn't be sustained muscular contractions during REM sleep. Okay, and this is a very complex neurologic process that uh, science still has not completely figured out. Um, but in people with REM behavior disorder, in which people physically enact their dreams, okay, uh, overnight sleep study testing demonstrates substantial muscular contractions or substantial pulses of uh, phasic muscle, muscular contractions during rapid eye movement sleep. And so unlike the other forms of parasomnias, REM behavior disorder does require overnight sleep study testing to make a solid diagnosis. That's also important to know. Most parasomnias, you don't need to do sleep study testing. Um, it, you can really ascertain the diagnosis purely based on a careful history. But uh, REM behavior disorder, you need to have a sleep study done. Okay. So uh, REM behavior disorder, again, the cl primary clinical feature is that uh, the patient is enacting their dreams. Because again, that muscle paralysis now has gone away, okay? Essentially, there are some complex brain stem functions that allow the brain to functionally disengage from the body muscles while you're dreaming under normal circumstances. However, in REM behavior disorder, that ability to functionally disengage your body muscles from your brainstem starts to slowly kind of deteriorate, so you start enacting your dreams. So for example, if you're dreaming of riding a bicycle down the road, um, in bed, in real life while you're sleeping, your legs may be pumping like you're riding a bicycle, okay? So that is the primary clinical feature of REM behavior disorder. There are some demographics that are important. Um, it's five times more likely to occur in men than in women. Nobody knows why, but it's much more, it's a very male predominant. Um, uh, it's much more likely to occur in patients over 50 years of age. Maybe it has something to do with the changes in microvasculature of the brainstem, but we don't really know that either. It's associated with a number of unusual things, like periodic movements in sleep, narcolepsy, um, and it's highly associated with the risk of developing neurodegenerative disorders. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment in further detail. Um, so typically during an event, the eyes are closed, um, and the movements typically reflect the dream imagery, and that's an important thing to know. If you're doing a clinical history, and if the spouse or bed partner is there, it's important for the uh, for the spouse uh, to be uh, counseled to ask the patient next time there is a movement, do you remember dreaming just now, right? And what do you remember dreaming about? So if the uh, dream seems to reflect uh, what is actually physically happening, then that makes it very, very likely that this is REM behavior disorder. So there's potential injuries um, to yourself. Uh, if you have this disorder, my dad actually had REM behavior disorder. Um, and uh, sometimes he would leap out of bed. Um, it's a gradually progressive disorder, so the longer you have it, the more likely the movements may occur. And the more violent the dreams, or the more aggressive the dreams, the more likely that somebody will see a physical manifestation of the dream, okay? All right, um, and so obviously this can cause uh, problems with the bed partner. Um, my mom used to get bruised up sometimes because my, my dad's movements. Um, so, um, so it's a point of clinical concern. Okay, there appears to be um, some form of uh, neuropathologic basis uh, behind REM behavior disorder, although again, it's the exact pathophysiology is yet to be completely uh, determined. Uh, unlike non-REM parasomnias, which typically are not associated with neuropathology, REM behavior disorder oftentimes is, either on a vascular level or uh, based on the presence of uh, alpha-synuclein, uh, which is this insoluble protein that can be inside of certain cells, vulnerable cells, which appears to be the basis for a small group of neurologic disorders, including Parkinson's disease, um, multiple system atrophy, and Lewy body dementia. So um, of those three, uh, 
uh, multi-system atrophy appears to be associated with the highest prevalence of REM behavior disorder. Somewhere between 60 and 90 percent of people with MSA uh, uh, have REM behavior disorder. So uh, typically, REM behavior disorder starts occurring prior to the onset of these degenerative disorders. And it was thought that it was kind of a, a precursor, but it appears now to be maybe more part of the spectrum, kind of a heralding symptom, set of symptoms that um, may eventually lead to a diagnosis of neurodegenerative disorders of various sorts. It's much more um, common in cytonucleinopathies than tauopathies, like Alzheimer's and other such things. Okay. You can also have acute uh, um, or non-idiopathic REM behavior disorder uh, that can be associated with alcohol withdrawal, um, the use of certain set of hypnotics, uh, and uh, strangely enough, certain medications, including medications that can actually cause REM suppression, have been associated with uh, the development of REM behavior disorder as well, including venlafaxine, which is a very, very powerful REM suppressant. Uh, virtually all the SSRIs, uh, beta blockers, a number of medications can be associated with the advent of dream enacting behaviors. Oh, am I done already? Really? Okay. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is show you a couple of examples of dream enacting behavior. And with the time we have left, I'll maybe show some sleep eating. Okay. Okay, so here's a 51-year-old Japanese man who was dreaming about, um, how do I get full screen here? Okay. And again, I'm sorry we don't have audio, but um, this man was uh, dreaming of uh, being a samurai and, um, and wielding a sword. So you'll see, uh, you'll see how he does that in a moment. Now remember, he's asleep, okay? He's dreaming. So he believes that he's doing this because of unconscious mentation. That's what REM sleep is, right? But this is a physical manifestation of what he's actually dreaming internally, which I find fascinating. So this is kind of a window into the soul. You can actually see what he's dreaming. So when he was asked later about what he dreamed of, he dreamed that he was being a samurai warrior. <laughs> it, gets, it gets better. <laughs> that looked more like a punch to me. He got it. Okay, you got the picture here. Are the eyes open? So usually they're closed, but sometimes the eyes can be open. Yeah. It can. I mean, you know, the funny thing is that we can't usually control what we dream, right? About two thirds of our dreaming is kind of negative in connotation, kind of sadness or danger or something, right? And again, I don't think anybody really knows why we're designed that way. I mean, for me, it's like 50%. Half, half my dreams are really happy and half my dreams really suck. So, um, so I think it makes sense that the more physically aggressive dreams are more likely to actually show up. I mean, if you're if you're dreaming of laying in a bed of flowers, for example, just kind of looking at the sky, probably nobody will notice anything. There was no movements in the dreams, so there's no movement physically, right? So, so it really depends in part on dream content and who's around and what time, you know, they a, a, a witness might be around, right? So, unlike non-REM parasomnias. REM behavior disorder typically occurs during the final third of the night, because that's when REM sleep uh, is the most. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, let me show a couple more examples. Um, let me about 
Again, I'm sorry there's no audio. Um, Carlos actually put in some great 80s music in some of these <laughs> montages. <clears throat> and there's a great one about um, this man is actually vocalizing. I mean, have you ever had a dream where you're actually saying something in the dream? Right? Well, those vocalizations come out too. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry I can't show that to you. But, uh, you know, this is, most of these people are from Minnesota, and so one of them was talking about, uh, about fishing. So you can imagine how disruptive this could be to a bed partner, right? Uh, right? Uh, I mean, it, it can cause all sorts of problems. I've actually had patients on the verge of divorce because of this kind of problem. So, yeah. How commonly do these episodes have to occur for it to be considered a diagnosis? Oh, I, I don't think a, a certain number of them matters. I think even if you have one, um, you know, I think that would count, right? But typically, if it's just one, it usually doesn't come to our attention, right? unless it was injurious, right? So that's a little bit different from epilepsy, right? Epilepsy is a situation in which there are numerous, more than one unprovoked uh, attacks, right? But if there's clear dream enacting behavior, um, it may or may not be witnessed, so, right? So one may be enough. So how often, when would you actually treat the patient? Once a week, twice a week. Well, so um, so I wish I had more time to talk about that. Um, there are some things that, that you can do as far as treatment is concerned that you should do with every patient with every parasomnia. And that number one thing is safety, right? So um, uh, how you do that depends on the clinical circumstance. But, um, but generally, I would recommend to all the patients that have some kind of unusual movement or behavior, you know, remove all sharp and hard objects out of the immediate area of your bed, because you can fall on stuff, and it's amazing what people have around their bed. Um, so remove that stuff. You may want to kind of uh, push your mattress up against a wall to reduce the risk of falling out. I've had patients put bed rails up, uh, install bed rails, uh, or put the mattress on the floor. For people that walk or have the risk of walking, uh, there ought to be some kind of an alarm on the door or a bell on the door. Uh, putting thick curtains around the windows, because there have been episodes of people jumping out of windows from sleepwalking. Um, so as far as uh, pharmacologic treatments, um, if there's a concern for, uh, for, for creating injury, and if there's a clear diagnosis of REM behavior disorder, then I would consider that. Okay? So the main reasons why I would consider treatment would be if there's a substantial potential for injury, right? if it's gradually progressive, if it's causing secondary sleep symptoms, like sleep disruption or daytime sleepiness, or if it's driving the bed partner crazy, I would consider uh, treatment. So the two pharmacologic treatments that are generally considered recommendations by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, for REM behavior disorder are melatonin and clonazepam. So clonazepam has long been considered kind of the drug of choice, um, and it appears to be probably the most effective if you take a look at the studies that are out there. However, <laughs> at this point, I typically utilize melatonin first, just simply because it's easy. I mean, it's over the counter, it's easily titratable, there are few side effects, it's cheap, it's non-controlled. Um, so I typically start off with, um, with um, melatonin use, especially in my patients with synucleinopathies. It appears to work well. What dose Well, it varies. As a neurologist, I like to start low and go slow, um, but uh, somewhere between 3 and 12 milligrams. So you can use fairly high doses of melatonin. Um, to get the effect, uh, but I generally don't start there. I start off with three to six milligrams. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I have a lot more time. Any other questions? Comments on Zolpidem? Yeah. Yeah. So Zolpidem has been clearly uh, demonstrated to be associated with uh, non recursive specifically sleepwalking, right? It's not clear, I think, why. That's happening as opposed to other non mesodiazepine types of agents for sleep. Um, but it appears to be highly associated with that. So I always warn patients if I get some star on the And in fact, a lot of times people come to me 
having already been on this epidemic, the reason why they're seeing it is because of the movement, because they found themselves out in front of the So the eight number one thing to do is to stop yourself. Other questions? You want to see some more video? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The eating, okay. I'll, before I do, I'll, I'll show you this one, which is, again, uh, these videos are taken in Minnesota, and so uh, this is a woman that uh, was dreaming about shoveling snow. Can you see it all right? Great. That looks kind of like she's shoveling snow, right? Okay. All right, so sleep eating, right? Okay. So sometimes these uh, eating events can just really happen all night long. Um, and uh, the food that people eat uh, may not necessarily be food. People have eaten things that they shouldn't be eating. I mean, detergent and uh, cat food and cigarettes and stuff. So uh, the degree to which a person actually eats a, an actual food um, can vary depending on the person. Um, but And if it's there, they may just kind of eat it or they may actually go down to the kitchen and cook a meal um, People have started fires in their homes because of that. So again, this appears to be some kind of offshoot of, uh, of sleep walking. But again, the essential kind of clinical features are the same. Um, there's confusion, there's near total amnesia about the events. So uh, the other possibility, as far as on the differential for this, would be nocturnal eating syndrome, which is when people just simply feel compelled to eat at night, but they're fully awake. So that's completely different from this. And the main re uh, reason why it's different is because there's, you're conscious. They may not feel like there's an internal conscious control, right? So they feel like they just, they feel compelled to do the eating, but they're awake. And they actually could physically keep themselves from doing it. Uh, but here they're, they're asleep, essentially. Yep. Any particular trend with eyes open or eyes shut? Uh, usually the eyes are open. Yeah, yeah. I mean that you know they're grabbing for something and they actually get it. Um, that's different from REM behavior disorder, right? Because what the person is in, enacting with is the internal environment, right? Um, if you're in a dream sequence, then you're interacting with everything that's in your head in the dream. But with non-REM parasomnies, which again I find really fascinating, they interact with the environment just on a very very primitive level, right? So there's food or something that looks like food. I'm going to eat it. Yep. Her yep. I mean, and that was done just because it's a sleep study. Gotcha. So they, I mean, would they assume that if that wasn't there, she may get up out of bed mm -hmm. or grab for something? That happens commonly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, this can cause obesity, diabetes. So, you know, people are like, well, I, you know, I'm not aware of it happening, but it's creating some kind of effect on me that I don't like. Right. So sometimes patients come to me. And this, they yeah. They when they wake up. Yeah, crumbs are in the bed. Mm -hmm. They feel full. There's stuff on their face. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they usually don't realize it until they wake up. And it's like, what is all this stuff? Yeah. And she does this. I mean, I think this video is like 20 minutes long. She does this all 20 minutes long. Okay. And then there's somebody named Pinky. I don't know what the significance is of Pinky, but. Um, but Pinky eats too. <clears throat> she can see a little bit of that component of sleepwalking, right? She actually gets out of bed, right? And if there wasn't food available, she would go down 
to the kitchen and whatever. Is that choking hazard and things associated with this? Like your brain is thinking you're eating, but is there a point where maybe it stops and it's true? So it's a question. I don't know. Um, I don't remember reading any literature about a higher incidence of choking with that. It wouldn't surprise me, I suppose. But I mean, swallowing is also a basic function, so maybe they do that properly. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think the choking risk is very high with this, um, just simply because I haven't read about it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, just a practical question. Yeah. Is, when you're taking a sleep history and someone talks about dreaming, yeah. um, at, at least for me, it, it immediately switches my brain off and I don't want to hear anything about it. <laughs> it's like ludicrous my mind. But do you take things out of that dream content? Do you take a dream history? Or Not you? usually. Uh, like, I, I've had that too, where somebody would make a big deal about some set of dream that they have. What does this mean, right? And um, I think there's a lot we don't really understand about the kind of content of the cult dream imagery. I mean, there's just a lot we don't really know, right? And um, so I think the degree to which this is clinically relevant is usually pretty questionable. So I agree with you. But I mean, it's important in this kind of situation in which there's an unusual movement of behavior to ask about dreams and whether or not the movements might square up to the dream recollection. So yeah. And then there's this thing called lucid dreaming. Have you heard about lucid dreaming? Has anybody tried lucid dreaming? It was it successful? <coughs> well, it, it has been on times, but unintended. I mean, I've tried it a million times. I, like, I go to bed and it's like, okay, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember, I'm gonna recognize that this is a dream, and I'm gonna do something like fly just to see it. And I never can do it. So lucid dreaming is when you have some kind of conscious meditation inside that you're actually in a dream. You, you're somehow aware that you're in the dream. You know, usually you're not aware that you're in the dream. You feel like it's actually happened. It's what happened to me. You know? um, but um, but in, in lucid dreaming, you recognize that you're in the dream, and then you try and manipulate the dream, right? And that has, I mean, if it works, then it has some useful implications, like if you have PTSD or something like that, right? Um, but this is very, very soft science. Um, it's something that has not been prone to uh, hard data for good studies. But if you can achieve that, that's a problem. Okay. Um, yes. So back to Mike's initial question about frontal lobe epilepsy yeah. and the sleep paralysis, yeah. which is the autonomic yeah. activity. Um, I mean, do you have any other tips about how you know, sort of video monitoring to distinguish these things? Because even during video monitoring, I was like, could we have a you know, there's like, So other than what I've mentioned tonight about kind of the frequency of them and kind of generally how they look like and what time of night, one thing that you can do is to see if you can identify and then remove some potential precipitating factors. Like for example, this happens a lot in teenagers, this night terrors, uh, or other confusional analysis and other such things, if they're sleep deprived, for example, if they're irregular sleep schedules. And teens, for example, they have irregular sleep schedules all the time, right? Delayed sleep days, but they sleep in until like noon on weekends, right? And then it's hard for them to go to sleep Sunday night and they have to wake up early, early and they're tired. So they're sleep deprived and the circadian rhythms are all just kind of crazy because they've just regulated their sleep schedules. Um, and that is a setup for non rem parasomnias. Mm -hmm. So if you were to do a detailed history on those types of aspects of their sleep habits and then trying to fix that, so they're getting as much sleep as the body intrinsically requires at that age. And if they can do it regularly, and if the effects stop, then it's much less likely to be <laughs> Typically not. So, so uh, there are times when frontal lobe epilepsy may occur multiple times in the night, right? Um, but these non are less likely to be. Uh, that varies highly. Okay. I mean, you get like four or five hours of sleep a night as a child, right? And some children do that. Because because the parents are more to take a lot of activities, whatever it is, um, and then they you know, sleep in substantially on weekends. Uh, that combination of, of irregular sleep schedule and chronic sleep deprivation can cause a setup for a lot of So typically, if there is one, it's usually once a night. It's usually during the first day. Yeah, so that would be one. Yeah. But
But I agree, there are times in which even video EG can be difficult. And sometimes you've got to do it a couple of times, and that's, yeah. Yes, correct. But it's not as much. So again, this is great, right? Because like what is actual stereo to see what is it, right? Like a complex part procedure out of city, oftentimes the automatic loop is going to be very experienced. And I have to do that for sure. Um, but not so much with another person. It can be very Yes. In terms of being confident, yeah. uh, is there a Way to differentiate between like PTSD, uh, that person, or the rest of the Yeah, so, uh, so PTSD usually involves nightmares, right? So there's a frightening dream uh, that may or may not be associated with the prior traumatic experience, and then the patient awakens abruptly and they're sweating and they're purple. So that's a difficult presentation for. Um, PTSD as far as dreams are concerned. So if they're yelling and acting out. That's wrong behavior disorder. It's a totally different thing. No, you can have both. You can have both. And that would be really bad if you have both PTSD and, and wrong behavior disorder because the movements may be violent. I can stick around for a couple minutes if anybody has questions. But thanks for your time.